I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute. Welcome, I'm Jim Copeland. I'm the director of the Center for Legal Policy at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to our policy forum on honest services fraud. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our, our guests here with us. Uh, I, I apologize first to those of you who are expecting to see Abby David Lowell, who had to cancel due to a uh, client obligation. But uh, I'm very confident that we're going to get our questions answered with the folks that are here. Uh, uh, Andy Wise, Andrew Wise, uh, is one of the top white collar criminal defense lawyers in the nation's capital. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Swarthmore and then went to the University of Michigan Law School where he graduated cum laude. Uh, he, he served some time in the public defender's office and since then has worked over in the private sector. Uh, he, he was involved at the highest level of one of the, the major uh, prosecutions in this area, and he'll be discussing that as, as we engage in our structured discussion uh, before we open up to audience questions after that. My colleague Marie Griffin, here to my immediate right, uh, is, is also trained as an attorney, uh, did, did her law work at the University of Washington School of Law, is now a PhD candidate uh, at, uh, at, at Harvard's Kennedy School of Public Policy. And she has, for now, what, three or four years been a senior fellow with us here at the Manhattan Institute. Before that, uh, she, she was in private practice uh, as an attorney and then a policy analyst with the Cato Institute in Washington. So I'm just going to sort of get right into the meat of this. And, and I'm going to start with Marie, because we're talking about something that it may be a little inside baseball for, for those of you out here who aren't in this area of law, we're talking about the honest services fraud law. What do, what do we mean by this? What is this federal criminal law? How did it come about? What do we talk about when we're talking about honest services fraud? Oh, well, basically what we're doing is we're referring to a statute that was a congressional response to a Supreme Court decision in 1987 called McNally versus United States. Um, and the McNally decision involved the Supreme Court attempting to, to reduce a certain amount of chaos that was going on in the lower courts at that time regarding the interpretation of the federal mail and wire fraud laws. Um, the uh, federal mail and wire fraud laws uh, criminalized any scheme or artifice to defraud. Um, and it was not always clear that involved the use of the mail or, mail or, or wire services. And it was not always clear exactly um, what the elements of this crime were. Uh, what the court said in McNally was, you know, it has to be, uh, the word defraud implies that money or property must be involved. You must be de defrauding the victim of money or property, not something as vague as the intangible right to honest services. So that's what the Supreme Court said. And they, they struck down um, or reversed the conviction in the McNally case. Now, Congress was not happy, and they weren't happy because uh, the people in the McNally case had actually done something wrong. There was a kickback scheme, political kickback scheme, going on in the state of Kentucky involving uh, some high-level politicos who had steered a state insurance contract uh, in return for basically side cash payments that enriched themselves. And so Congress said, well, this is the sort of thing that uh, we think should be a federal crime. Now, they could have reacted to this by enacting a federal anti-kickback law, which specifically de described the practice of kickback you know, um, solicitation and criminalized that in clear language, but they didn't. Instead, they simply uh, passed a 28-word addendum to the mail and wire fraud laws uh, in which they cribbed the Supreme Court's uh, slightly sarcastic language and said, well, you know, uh, for the purposes of this section, the term scheme or artifice to defraud shall include uh, the intangible right to honest services. And of course, uh, chaos has ensued because nobody knows exactly what that language means. So Andy, uh, Justice Scalia actually sort of got the ball rolling here. Uh, he, he was the first to really uh, 
signal his alarm at, at the vagueness of this statute. What, what exactly did Justice Scalia say here? Or how did this get started as, as somewhere yeah. uh, that the, the public was really uh, worried about this? Well, this issue has come to something of a rapid boil because in February of 2009, the Supreme Court received a request uh, in a case out of Chicago that involved a political patronage scheme, and one of the defendants' names was Robert Sorich. The essential allegation in the scheme was that Sorich had worked in connection with an office that ensured that people who had been political supporters of the winning party got city jobs. It was not really a very secret scheme. This had been going on kind of in the open for many years in Chicago. But these folks were prosecuted under the theory that they had, by giving out these jobs based on political connections rather than merit, deprived the voters and the citizens of the honest services and honest functioning of their government. They were convicted, and the Seventh Circuit upheld the conviction, and Sorage and others asked the Supreme Court to review their convictions, and the Supreme Court refused to, denied uh, what's called a, a grant of a writ of certiorari. Now, normally when that happens, it's a two-line order, and there are very infrequently do justices write opinions, even if they feel the court should have taken the case. But Justice Scalia wrote a nine-page dissent from the denial of certiorari, in which he basically recounted the past 15 years or so of the use of this statute, and, and said, in essence, that Prosecutors have always taken the position that this statute, while it doesn't give you much guidance in its own words, is applied in such a way that people out in the world know what they're not allowed to do. They know when they're running afoul of the criminal law. And Justice Scalia essentially said that he thought that that was preposterous, that the language of the statute was so vague that it invited uh, headline-grabbing prosecutors, was I think his quote, um, to abuse the statute, to go after cases that had recently been in the popular press. And he essentially suggested that what the courts had allowed was the establishment of a common law federal crime of unethical or dishonest behavior that he said was being applied to an incredibly wide swath of conduct. Now. When Justice Scalia wrote this opinion in, in 09, it was not entirely clear uh, whether he was essentially writing his own view or whether he was supporting the view of a, of, a, of a large minority or even a majority of the court. The court, in order to take a case, has to have four votes to grant certiorari. So it wasn't clear whether Justice Scalia was out on his own or whether there were three others or whether there were five others who just didn't feel that this case was the right case to, to address the statutory issues. But that uh, was followed about three months later by the Supreme Court's grant of certiorari in a case involving Conrad Black uh, and a gentleman named Bruce Weirauch, who was a lawmaker from Alaska, and then a third case, Jeff Skilling, the former CFO of Enron. So in the last, uh, so two of the cases were argued in December, and Skilling was argued in March of this year. So within the period of about six months, the court granted certiorari on three separate honest services cases and has now taken argument. And the expectation is that by the end of the term, uh, which is June of this year, the court will announce decisions in all three cases, which will probably substantially change the contours of the law as it exists. Thanks, Andy. Well, I want to turn to you with a broad question now, Marie. Uh, Marie wrote a, a paper for us, a civil justice report for the Center for Legal Policy in December, uh, entitled, It's a Crime, Flaws in Federal Statutes that Punish Standard Business Practice. And, and Marie's paper was looking at the honest services fraud as an example of uh, one of the problems with federal criminal statutes, particularly those that are overly vague or overly ambiguous. What, what is the problem with a, a criminal law that, that's vague or ambiguous in the first place? Uh, well, the, the fundamental problem with vague and ambiguous statutes is that they undermine a very important tradition in uh, Anglo-American criminal law, which is the, the blameworthiness standard. 
Uh, traditionally, in uh, our legal system, we reserve criminal sanctions as opposed to civil sanctions for those who have truly earned society's harsh condemnation. And we like to keep the criminal law clear so that people can tell in advance uh, whether what they're going to do is going to be legal or illegal. Uh, we like to believe that the people that we uh, deny civil rights to and incarcerate and who bear a lifelong stigma of criminal conviction are people who have really knowingly gone out and done something wrong. Unfortunately, this traditional standard has been eroded in the 20th century as Congress has increasingly turned to criminal penalties in an effort to solve what are really business regulatory issues, um, health and safety issues, environmental issues. Um, and in uh, an understandable zeal to in, you know, pursue these important public policy goals, Congress has unfortunately gone too far in the drafting of a lot of federal statutes, and they've done things like uh, omit traditional mens rea language, such as words like knowingly, purposely, uh, recklessly. Um, and as a result, uh, courts have held that a lot of federal criminal laws now are strict liability crimes. Uh, you, you, you need not have any idea uh, that, uh, that the things that you have done uh, basically amount to uh, an act that the court has, you know, that, that the Congress has decided is illegal. Um, in the same vein, vague and ambiguous laws make it very difficult to know in advance whether a particular business activity is on one side of the line, in which case you might even be obligated to do it, say, you know, compete aggressively with rival companies, uh, come up with an effective marketing strategy, or whether it has crossed the line and is now on the other side. And honest services fraud is exactly this kind of statute. There's actually a difference between vagueness and ambiguity. Um, in the law. Ambiguity uh, is basically a word used to refer to uh, uh, a term that has uh, you know, two or more specific possible meanings. For example, if I use the word cool, I could mean that somebody is, is fashionable or likable, but I could also <laughs> mean you know, something that is you know, colder than room temperature. Uh, that's an ambiguous term. On the other hand, we have vague terms. And vague term might be something like tall. Well, how tall? You know, what constitutes tall? 5'7", 5 5'8", 5 5 5 How do we know when we're tall? And uh, ambiguous statutes are not as bad because at least the court can use what is termed the rule of lenity, which means you know, if you've got two or three clear-cut possibilities for what a statute means, you choose the narrower interpretation in order to protect the non-blameworthy individual who misinterprets the statute. And if Congress wants the broader meaning, they need to be more specific. Uh, the problem with vague statutes is that you can't pick from among a determinate number of possible meanings for the statute. And unfortunately, the honest services fraud statute is this kind of statute. It can mean any number of things. And the problem with that is that unless the court is willing to hold the entire statute void for vagueness under due process, which it may do, um, it will have to construct a narrow interpretation of the statute out of whole cloth, and that's judicial lawmaking. And while I think in this particular case, it's certainly a better solution than allowing the kind of um, competing interpretations we're seeing at the lower court levels. It's not ideal, and it's not the kind of situation we should be putting the federal courts in. That's very helpful. Now, Andy, as I said, is, is one of the, the top criminal defense lawyers in this area. He's a partner at Miller and Chevalier, and he actually defended uh, one of these so-called white-collar crime cases under the Honest Services Fraud Law for a, a fellow named Kevin Ring. I, explain to us a little bit about what, what this case is about and, 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 and why it was significant. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Kevin Ring was indicted on, on, a, on a number of charges, mostly uh, surrounding the Honest Services Statute. He was a lobbyist in D.C. who had the great fortune of working with Jack Abramoff <laughs> and was therefore fairly high in the government's sights when the government kicked off the Abramoff investigation. Kevin had been um, a 29-year-old staffer who came off the hill in about 2000 and joined Abramoff's firm when Abramoff was widely recognized in D.C. as the preeminent Republican lobbyist in the city. A lot of what drew the government's attention in the Abramoff investigation was actually not his lobbying activity. It was garden variety defrauding of many of his clients, including a number of Indian tribes. But the government's investigation focused not only on that, but also on contacts with various lawmakers, congressmen, and their staff. Uh, 
Kevin was indicted on charges, essentially, that he and others at the lobby shop had engaged in the giving of gifts, which were meals, tickets, entertainment, all in DC, at least with regard to Kevin, all in open sporting venues and restaurants close to Capitol Hill with congressmen and their staff that they then lobbied on various issues. There was a lot of talk in the indictment about campaign contributions and fundraisers that were held for various lawmakers. And the allegation that the government made was that he had participated in a scheme to defraud the voters of the honest services of the lawmakers by engaging in activity designed to make the lawmakers um, more amenable to the requests of the lobbyists based on the gifts rather than necessarily the policy uh, arguments, which on one hand uh, to the government sounded like fraud and on the other hand to many in Washington sounded a lot like lobbying. The case went to trial uh, last fall in DC in front of a jury uh, that was, I would say, quite uh, attentive and quite vigilant. The jury deliberated for eight days and came back split almost evenly down the middle. It was an interesting case because it showed, uh, I think, a lot of the issues with this statute. There was very little uh, disagreement about what the facts were. This was not a case where the government said, these lobbyists took people to this game and the defense said, no, that wasn't us, it was somebody else. There was almost no argument about the meals, the tickets. There was very little argument that the meals and tickets uh, in some instances were in excess of then applicable Senate and House rules which governed what staffers and congressmen could accept uh, but there was also very little um, argument from the government that these rules that applied to the House and Senate staffers either applied to lobbyists whatsoever or were punishable by criminal sanction. So it was a case where a lot of the presentation of evidence to the jury was a behavior that was unquestionably um, distasteful to a lay jury. It was the kind of thing that, especially to a Washington, D.C. jury, made people cringe. Um, but it was up until the day of closing, and this is obviously from a defense standpoint, but up until the day of closing, not entirely clear where the crime was as opposed to where the distasteful behavior was. And one of the things that Justice Scalia wrote when he wrote his uh, dissent in Sorich was that the way that the law had developed failed to give average citizens notice of what fell on the criminal side and what fell on just the dishonest behavior side. And it could not be that you learned what the elements of your crime were during the judicial proceeding that sent you to jail. And many people reading it said, oh, this is Justice Scalia's uh, love for colorful language. In Kevin's case, the government often argued that what they were presenting was evidence of a bribery-esque scheme <laughs> and that that itself allowed them to go to the jury. We constantly argued that it had to be more, that if, that, that if honest services was distinct from the federal bribery statute and was in, in essence a fraud, that the government had to prove things that made conduct in the traditional sense a fraud some effort to conceal the behavior, some material misrepresentation. And in, in Kevin's case, there really was very little of that. There were emails every once in a while that used coded language, in part because these were 30-year-olds on Blackberries. But most of these things were literally, I mean, the government showed the jury the feed from a Wizards game that showed Kevin and one of his alleged co-conspirators sitting in the front row of a Wizards game cheering. Now, if you've been in DC, you know that cheering at a Wizards game may have been a doctored piece of evidence in any <laughs> event. But the idea that these guys were sitting in the front row did not kind of fit with your typical view of a smoke-filled backroom fraud scheme. The day of jury instructions, after the evidence had closed, 
and, the, and we were 24 hours away from closing, the government came in and said, we've changed our mind on the element of material misrepresentation, and now we do agree that the jury must find material misrepresentation in order to convict on this fraud scheme, which was, as, as Kevin's lawyers, we were fine with that because the more the government had to prove, the better. But it was quite curious that after for a year arguing that this was not an element of an offense that everybody knew what was prohibited, the government would come change their position that day. I think that the reason that that happened was that the Solicitor General was about to file a brief in the Supreme Court in the Conrad Black case. And one of the arguments that they made in the brief that was filed two days later was, in every prosecution under this statute, these core elements have been in place, and so it's clear what this crime consists of. And one of those elements was material misrepresentation. So that was probably in a longer-winded way than we wanted, a discussion no, of just... Kevin Ring's trial and, and some of the issues that it presented. And, and so, so what was the end result? The end result was that the jury hung, and we are set to retry the case in July of this coming year. Now, 75% of the indictment is on a services charges, and so we're all waiting to see what the Supreme Court's going to do. The government has said that even if the Supreme Court throws the statute out, they're going to retry Kevin on a standalone gratuities charge, which is an allegation that he gave a friend of his eight tickets to a Wizards game after the friend passed on an email. Uh, we'll see whether that, that case ends up being a standalone trial and whether if this court doesn't strike down the whole statute, whether they give it sufficient guidance that the judge who who's, knows more about this than just about anybody now, having been so invested in it, can carve out instructions that make sense of this statute. So. Right, well now one of the cases before the Supreme Court currently, the Weirach case we we'd, we'd mentioned, uh, is another political corruption case, similar to this Kevin Ring case in, in, in some respects. Explain for us, Marie, what, what is this Weirach case about and, and, and what's troubling about it from your perspective? I think the Weirach case is really interesting and it's uh, troubling for at least two reasons. Uh, one is the issue of blameworthiness in the criminal law and the other is the issue of federalism uh, and the right of uh, state governments to manage their own affairs. Uh, Bruce Weirach was a state lawmaker in Alaska um, and he was charged with honest services fraud uh, by prosecutors because he had voted on some bills that affected oil interests in the state. Having already passed on his resume to an oil company in the state and expressed his interest in joining that company after his legislative term ended. Um, and so for failing to disclose that he had a potential conflict of interest on these votes, he was charged with federal honest services fraud. The thing is that Alaska has a long and complicated code of legislative ethics that prescribes what kinds of disclosures are required by state lawmakers in various types of circumstances, and they specifically declined to require disclosure of potential conflicts of interest like the one that Bruce Weirach had. And federal prosecutors didn't disagree with that. Federal prosecutors also couldn't disagree with the fact that there was nothing at all in Alaska statutory law that rendered uh, his behavior in any way uh, illegal. And you know, it might be one thing if they had charged him with, say, selling favors, something intrinsically wrongful, that even if it didn't violate the letter of state law, at least he was on notice. This is what a, lawyers would call a malum in se offense. It's an intrinsically wrongful thing. You should have known that what you were doing was wrong. But that's not what happened. What we're looking at here is an entirely prophylactic rule. Uh, this is a rule that you know, doesn't prevent wrongful behavior in itself, but just uh, avoids the circumstances in which one might be tempted to engage in wrongful behavior. And these prophylactic rules that regulate disclosures by state lawmakers, we traditionally leave to the states. Uh, so here was a guy who was charged with honest services fraud, uh, who did nothing wrong according to all of the rules that governed his employment for the state of Alaska. Um, and the prosecutors did not allege otherwise. If his case is upheld, uh, or if his con you know, conviction is upheld in the Supreme Court, then we'll have a situation where um, no one, whether you work for a state government as he did, or in the private sector, because this law applies equally to the private sector, uh, will know that having scrupulously and carefully followed the letter of every uh, manifestation of your employment relationship, um, 
demands of you, uh, that you will be safe from having somehow committed honest services fraud because some prosecutor will come along later and decide that your employer, our state, was delinquent in not coming up with a new prophylactic preventative measure that you should have followed, but that is not, in fact, in the rule book. Uh, so I think this is a very serious problem. So let's, let's look at some of these private cases. The other two cases before the Supreme Court are private cases. And we'll start uh, with the Conrad Black case, which was argued first in December. Uh, Andy, tell us a little bit about this Conrad Black case. What's, what's at issue? Yeah, Conrad Black, by the time it got to the Supreme Court, was a fairly narrow issue. Conrad Black was the former CEO of Hollinger Corporation, which was a, basically a newspaper and publishing company. The government's allegation essentially was that at, at a certain point, Black and others within the company decided to sell off parts of the company's operation. And in making that deal, structured part of the payment back as a non-compete agreement, which the government's allegation was was essentially fraudulent because there was no chance that there was actually going to be competition from Black and the others. And essentially, this was a way to pay Black and some of the other individuals who had been higher up in the Hollinger Company fees to which they arguably were not entitled. The government indicted the case on, on a basic mail and wire fraud theory, which in essence the theory was that, the, that Black and his co-defendants had stolen money from Hollinger by siphoning off money that should have gone to the company and that, therefore to the shareholders to themselves but also indicted an honest services count, which they argued to the jury was an alternative way that the jury could convict. And essentially, the honest services count was that Black and others had deprived the shareholders of their honest services by constructing these fees as a non-compete agreement. That made the case a little muddy, because the fees were, if I think both parties would have conceded if they had been properly categorized, they would have been called management fees, and there was some suggestion that they were called non-compete fees because of uh, Canadian tax implications that they would have had on, on Conrad Black and the others. But the issue as it got to the Supreme Court was whether or not, in order to prove a violation of this honest services statute, the government had to prove that the alleged schemers intended for there to be an economic gain to themselves and an economic harm to the company that was alleged to be the victim. What was interesting about the way the argument went down, because Black and Weirach were argued the same day, was that in part, I think, because of the way that the lower courts had handled honest services cases over the past 15 years, neither Black nor Weirach took on the constitutional vagueness argument as their main tact. They both argued, I think probably in recognition that the Supreme Court very rarely likes to decide a constitutional issue when it can address a statute through a more narrow means. Both Black and Weirach essentially said to the court, even if you don't find that the statute is constitutionally vague, you have to apply some limiting principle in order to give it notice in order to give folks fair notice of what's required. So Black said that the economic harm had to be an element, and Weirach argued a, a state law violation had to be an element in order to make this kind of vague statute less vague. Within about five minutes of the beginning of the argument in, in the court, it became fairly clear that the court really was interested in the constitutional vagueness argument. <laughs> so Miguel Estrada, who was arguing for Conrad Black, very quickly and artfully pivoted into an argument where he essentially said, of, of course we're here to discuss the vagueness issues. Why would we not concentrate on the vagueness <laughs> issues, Your Honors? And for the two hours of the argument, most of the questions were designed to drill down on the issue of whether this law gave people notice of what was prohibited and whether it was sufficiently cabined such that an overzealous prosecutor could not go after conduct that should be well outside the realm of the federal law. Do, do you want to add something to that, or, or do we want to go? Let's, let's go to the Let's third case, the, the, the Jeff Skilling case. And, and this is one that, unlike the other two, I, I think most folks are aware of, of the general fraud allegations at play. This is, this is the guy who was running Enron and 
and, and, and uh, creating offshore accounts and all this sort of stuff. And, and this third case, uh, one, of the, one of the two main challenges uh, to the skilling conviction uh, were, were, was also on this honest services fraud question. Do you, you want to talk a little bit about that? Mary? Sure. Um, well, I've read all the briefs, and I actually have very little sympathy for this guy. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he, was, he was convicted on, I think, was it 14 counts? Somewhat less. Uh, more. More? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, various uh, federal charges. Uh, most of them, I believe, were securities fraud, uh, but also uh, false statements acts, making false statements to federal officials, um, one count of insider trading, uh, and then honest services fraud, which is what put his, puts him in the suite of three cases that we're here to discuss today. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about the Skilling case is that uh, the, uh, the prosecutors could adduce no evidence, and indeed did not seriously argue, that Skilling acted from any motive in making all of these misleading statements uh, with which he was charged uh, for honest services fraud, acted from any motive of personal gain whatsoever, that he wasn't entirely motivated by the prospect of attempting to save this hopelessly moribund company, Enron. And uh, this is a scary inference. And in fact, the uh, federal prosecutors who prosecuted Wayrock had argued exactly the opposite, that no, no, you need to have, this is an element, you need to have a prospect of personal gain. But this is the problem of having a statute as vague as honest services fraud, is that federal prosecutors can argue, and of course it's different individuals and different branch offices, but out of both sides of their mouths. They can argue, yes, this is an element in some cases, no, this is an element in others. Um, and uh, if anything demonstrates clearly that the ordinary citizen can't tell what's prohibited, this behavior on the part of the Department of Justice certainly proves it. Um, so uh, Skilling, although uh, will be in jail for quite a while regardless of how the Honest Services decision comes out, but I think that his case uh, is being considered for a good reason and stands for something genuinely dangerous. Uh, does fraud have to involve any idea whatsoever of advancing an aim of yours that's not you know, purely uh, a, a, a matter of selflessly advancing the victim's aim, which was the only thing they really had evidence for, and that will be interesting. So, Andy, what do, we, what do we think the Supreme Court's going to do? And, and if, uh, in fact, the Supreme Court comes in there and says, we're going to throw out this law entirely, it's unconstitutionally vague, what does that mean? What are the collateral consequences? Yeah. How is that going to affect people who've already been convicted? How is that going to affect uh, future prosecutions, et cetera? Yeah. If you had asked me that question after the Black and Weirauch arguments, I think I would have said with a fair degree of confidence, that it looked like the court was really considering striking down the statute. There were a number of questions during that two hours where a number of the justices, and not just Justice Scalia, but uh, Justice Breyer, all the way to Justice Alito, were asking questions that focused on the issue of how do we cabin this statute in. Justice Scalia, in all of these arguments, uh, had an example that he loved, which is he would say to whoever was standing at the podium, and acting as his foil. Um, we all know that murder is wrong, but if, we, if Congress passed a law that said you shall do nothing wrong, and that was used to prosecute murder, you couldn't stand here and tell me that that was not a vague law. That's probably a bit hyperbolic. Um, but a lot of the other discussion was about, well, what about the employee who tells his boss that he's going to be working hard that day and actually goes to the baseball game or spends his day reading the racing form. He's deprived his employer of his honest services and he's made a misrepresentation about what it is that he's doing, but it can't be that that rises to the level of a federal crime. There was a little bit of hesitancy in those two arguments because neither of the parties had really briefed the issue of whether this statute was unconstitutional. And so the court said, essentially, we have skilling coming. We have that issue in skilling, so we'll take it up with skilling. And I, as the lawyer for Kevin Ring, ran to the Supreme Court in March, excited to see the court issue the final coup de grace to the honest services statute. And most of the skilling argument was not about honest services. Skilling also had another issue, which was his contention that the venue in Houston was so poisonous that there was no way he could get a fair trial. And the judge conducting the jury voir dire did it fairly quickly in that trial. Um, 
so quickly that the former trial judges, Sotomayor especially, really did seem to be troubled by how quickly the judge had gone through the panel and, and seated this jury. Um, and Skilling's lawyer, who was quite good uh, and had very little interest actually in talking about honest services because an honest services reversal would terminate one out of his <laughs> dozens of counts, whereas a venue issue affected every count. Talked for about 22 minutes before, 22 of his 30 minutes before Chief Justice Roberts suggested that maybe he move on to the honest services count, to which he did, somewhat grudgingly. And there was <laughs> some discussion, Justice Scalia asked his question about what if we had a law that said do no wrong. Um, but there really was very little discussion about honest services in, on either side in Skilling, which I think left many commentators somewhat perplexed. Some have suggested that it, it, it means that the court had decided that, that it knew what it was going to do and didn't need to address it. I'm not sure what to make of where the court was in Skilling. I do think it's, it's hard to imagine this Supreme Court taking a statute that is as vague as the honest services statute and essentially writing in limitations. One of the things the government had argued in Skilling was that going back decades, honest services fraud was universally understood to apply to bribery and kickback schemes. So even if the court found that the statute was wildly overbroad and vague, it could reasonably construe the statute to apply to those schemes, which I think is an argument that might have, might resonate with some of the justices. But it, it, I, I do think it's hard to imagine Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, um, even Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts to some degree, being willing to engage in judicial lawmaking by rewriting a statute when what led to this whole problem was the court in McNally saying, if Congress wants this to be a crime, speak more clearly, and Congress returning with such a vague law. The, the flip side is that um, I do think the court is practical. And uh, in a Second Circuit decision in 2004, the court uh, suggested that there had been 470 opinions dealing with honest services in 20 years. And as much as, as defense lawyers get on panels and spin this as a horror where someone's going to go to jail for using the internet when they're at work, a lot of these cases do involve fairly clear fraud schemes. And I do think you would have a situation where at least folks that were, on, that were convicted and had a direct appeal would have an ability to have their convictions pulled. And I think you'd see a wave of motions for new trial under a section of the federal code that allows defendants to seek relief in the event that what they've been convicted for is now said by the Supreme Court to not be criminal in nature. Um, I think that is a realistic uh, consideration that the court will, of course, deny having considered, but I think any jurist has to consider these things. And then there's the next question of what do you do going forward? Um, and I think in some ways the debate, at least among academics, has been whether there is sufficient breadth in the federal code to cover what prosecutors want to get at. I think most defense lawyers, in fact every defense lawyer, would suggest that the federal code has so many provisions criminalizing fraudulent behavior that the idea that a federal prosecutor cannot bring a case if honest services is struck down is just an argument that can't be uh, sustained. <laughs> and I think you look at Rod Blagojevich's indictment, and it's a pretty good example. Blagojevich in his first indictment was indicted essentially on honest services fraud counts and conspiracy. Uh, Pat Fitzgerald, I think, in a very smart move in February, returned a second superseding indictment, which alleged all the same facts, all of the same honest services counts, but then had another eight counts that alleged uh, the same conduct under different federal statutes. So there was an allegation that there was an extortion, an attempt to extort a congressman. There was an allegation that they, that uh, Blagojevich and his co-defendants had violated a law that makes it a crime to uh, propose a bribe to a state official involving a program that, in, that, in, that, include, that gets more than $10,000 in federal funding. There was, I believe, a standalone bribery count. There was a conspiracy count. All the same behavior was now covered under statutes that carried substantially similar penalties. 
Um, and I think that, in some ways, is a template for the, the answer to the question of, will prosecutors still be able to go after bad guys? Um, so that's my guess. Sounds reasonable to me. Now, Marie, <laughs> uh, wanna, before we open up to audience questions, want to just take one last sort of moving it back to a broad question with this. If, in fact, uh, the Supreme Court comes in here and, and overturns this statute, uh, Congress is sure to react uh, just like they did last time when they first set up uh, this honest services provision. And, and you, in your paper, talk about various uh, rules of decision or various principles that Congress should embrace when they're trying to address uh, this issue, when they're trying to write federal criminal laws. Uh, spell those out for us. How should Congress behave uh, to, to try to avoid getting into the same sort of mess that we find ourselves in now? Sure. Well, this is a big problem, uh, and it's, a, it's actually an argument for a, a narrow judicial construction of the honest services fraud statute because that might actually wind up being clearer and more sensible than the congressional response that we may get. Uh, Congress is not very good at drafting uh, new crimes, but that doesn't stop them. They draft new crimes all the time. There are actually 150 plus uh, uh, bills now pending in the House or Senate that create uh, either new federal crimes or expand the reach or penalties associated with current federal crimes. So this is something that Congress is doing constantly. Um, and vagueness, obviously, is one of their problems, uh, but they haven't been entirely chastened by the trouble they've had with honest services fraud. Uh, there's a bill called the, Anti the Price Gouging Prevention Act uh, <laughs> sitting in the House right now, which would make it a crime punishable by up to 10 years for each instance, for each day of charging gasoline at quote unquote unconscionably excessive prices. Uh, as you might imagine, this you know uh, was originated shortly after the gasoline price spike that we all experienced a couple of years ago. What on earth is unconscionably excessive? Well, don't worry. Congress uh, had some language to help you out. It's unconscionably excessive if it grossly deviates from what you had charged in the recent past. What's a gross deviation? If gasoline prices in your market area spike, how do you know that is 10% grossly deviate, this 20%, and all you're doing is following the prevailing market price for gasoline in your region? It, the stuff like this is terrible, and it's happening all the time. So that's one example of a problem, vague language. Uh, there are two other things that I told con Congress in this report, I don't know if they were listening, that if they would just stop doing these two other things too. Um, most of the problem about about sweeping in unblameworthy people into the federal criminal law could be avoided. Um, the, uh, the other two were uh, including appropriate mens rea terminology. So when you're making something into a crime, we have certain keywords that tell judges what level of mens rea or a guilty mind is required. You know, did you need to do it purposely? Did you need to do it knowingly? Did you need to do it recklessly? What did you need? You know, you leave this stuff out, and next thing you know, some judges decided it's a strict liability crime. And that's a serious problem for ordinary business people who are just trying to do their jobs. Uh, the third thing they need to stop doing is criminalizing, in my view, the Code of Federal Regulations. Right now, Congress has developed the habit of passing federal criminal laws that effectively criminalize violations of vast swaths of the CFR. And unlike the United States Code, the CFR is far, far much larger. It's not passed by Congress. It's promulgated by unelected bureaucrats. It's changing all the time. And even experts disagree constantly on what this or that new regulation means. Uh, but misunderstanding a regulation in, say, the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act uh, can get you jail time under federal laws that currently exist exists, and these statutes are constantly changing. Nor do you have to suspect that what you did was illegal. Uh, in a case called White versus United States, uh, a company, a small business, hired a consultant to come in and tell them what the statute uh, you know, required and what the Code of Federal Regulations required. Uh, the consultant gave them what was apparently the wrong answer, and they were charged and convicted of a federal crime. So those are three things that Congress can do better. All right, uh, I want to open up to audience questions. We've got some microphones that will be passed out, so please identify yourself uh, before you ask your question, and then we'll, we'll see what we, can, what we can say in response. In the back, we've got uh, Mr. Curry, who 
uh, is, is, is somebody who's been involved in, with Conrad Black in litigation, so. so well, actually, a little short of litigation. Uh, there was a gentleman named Chris Brown who was on the board of the Manhattan Institute who uh, died towards the end of last year. Uh, and he was a principal in an, a very large mutual fund, Tweedy Brown, uh, that many of you may know of as a very substantial player in the investment community. And in 2004, I was retained by Chris, uh, who at that point held 20% of Conrad Black's company, Hollinger, stock, uh, to basically rid the company of Conrad Black. <laughs> and without litigation, mostly with publicity, we managed to do that. And lo and behold, the price of that stock doubled because the market had put a black discount on the stock. Um, but in the process, I became aware of, and so did the Delaware Chancery Court. I'm a corporate lawyer, I'm not a litigator, so this isn't really my turf. But the vice chancellor in Delaware wrote a 130-page opinion about the way Conrad Black operated in his company. And picking up on the non-compete agreements, uh, the vice chancellor said, uh, Black was a key recipient of the non-compete agreements and his protestations of ignorance about the circumstances that led to those payments strained credulity given his controlling and hands-on management style in the absence of any plausible explanation as to why it was done. Other than, frankly, it was a Canadian tax dodge, but it's just like saying, well, I sold the company, you should give me a reward. So as a corporate lawyer, that was pretty repugnant. Uh, on the other hand, a as a sort of average citizen, this is a grotesquely overly broad statute. So my question, I guess, is given the amount of wrongdoing that Conrad Black engaged in in terms of looting his company, uh, which if you apply the civil law standard or the standard of the Delaware Chancery Court, he did, and it's documented. Uh, in the absence of this statute, what would take its place to basically keep the societal norms straight and people who used a former partner of KPMG and a former partner of Tories as their inside advisors to skirt the law how do you keep those people honest? But that's sort of the question we, we talked about at the end there, Andy. Any ideas here? Well, I think that raises an interesting issue. And, and I think part of most of the answer is this. <coughs> the failure to convict Conrad Black on the fraud, on the monetary fraud theories, and I think what makes the Black case interesting and what gave his lawyers some traction was that Black was charged with a number of just straight mail-and-wire fraud counts, alleging that he had stole, essentially stolen money from the company. He was acquitted on a number of those counts and convicted on the honest services count, and his lawyers argued that what that showed was that the jury just didn't really understand what this intangible right of honest services meant because they necessarily had concluded that he didn't steal money from the company. It sounds from your take like that conclusion wasn't one that was consistent with the facts. And that, I would suggest, is really more of a proof problem than a legal doctrine problem. In the event that prosecutors can prove that someone has fleeced their company, has categorized a payment as something other than what it really was, when what it really was was a, an opportunity for them to take money that belonged to the shareholders. That behavior is unquestionably covered by the mail and wire fraud statutes and would be, if the honest services statute was struck down and has been for hundreds of years. Um, I do think what you get a lot of times in these white collar cases is factual patterns that are so complicated that the average juror has a lot of trouble understanding it and following it. And in some ways, the honest services statute becomes doubly dangerous there because it allows a juror to say, I have no idea what I've heard for the last eight weeks, but I know it stinks. And now I have this statute that talks about the intangible right of honest services. I don't know what that is, but it sounds <laughs> kind of like what strikes me as stinky behavior. <laughs> in essence, I think what prosecutors need to be able to do is break down why this is a fraudulent scheme better, but I don't think it it, it argues in favor of a statute that is as vague as it is. you have something to add, Marie? Um, just that good justice isn't necessarily easy. Um, you know, prosecutors lobby for very, very broad 
criminal laws, and they do it for a reason. It makes their jobs easier. And these are overwhelmingly well-intended people who want to be able to go after guys that strike them, at, you know, men and women who genuinely strike them as having done something wrong. Uh, but they don't want to work as hard as they will have to work uh, if they're required to prove their case uh, according to the very specific terms of statutes that ordinary people can understand. Um, this is a, uh, a tendency that needs to be resisted, I think. It's important for our system of justice that we have clear rules, that people have fair notice, and if we need more prosecutors, if we need better trained prosecutors, or if the prosecutors need to you know, surf the internet less at work, uh, I think it's worthwhile. Can I, can I add a footnote to that? Sure. The irony here, for those of you who enjoy irony, is that the chairman of the audit committee of Hollinger International which supposedly was on watch for Conrad Black's defalcations, actually prosecuted, when, when T Jim Thompson was a US attorney for Chicago, prosecuted Otto Kerner, then a circuit court judge, formerly governor of Illinois, on theft of honest services, <laughs> and won a conviction. It's, it's that, that's, that's an interesting aside. I, I wanna add just one sort of additional thought to what Annie Marie have said on this, and that's we don't always have to use the criminal law to, to, to deter bad conduct. Uh, I mean, the, the securities laws are extremely detailed uh, and uh, there's lots of, of disclosures that are required to be made and uh, it, it, it's pretty easy to violate these securities laws, uh, both civilly and criminally, particularly after the Sarbanes-Oxley rules, which, which I've criticized in other contexts. Uh, and so th th there's actually a lot to, de to deter material misrepresentations to shareholders. There's also, of course, what the area of law you're particularly involved in, the, 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 the corporate law, and, and standard duty of loyalty types of requirements in places like Delaware. The fact that you were able to win in Delaware Chancery Court, of course, I, I think mitigates in favor of saying, well, some of these things, uh, while they're wrong, if we can't really put our finger on it or define it in advance, uh, maybe it should just be civil and be after the fact. I mean, for, for sure, there's going to be litigation in a lot of these sorts of cases, and for sure these people are going to be deterred uh, through their pocketbooks, even if they don't wind up in jail. So, In the back over there. And please identify yourself and then ask a question. Thanks. Uh, Steve Hockman is my name. I'm a recovering lawyer, now mediator. Um, I I'm a little confused here. Uh, I understand um, the honor services uh, um, in the civil context, you know, if somebody didn't earn what they got, they should give it back, because I'm a little confused about the criminalization part. Now, breach of fiduciary duty, as I understand it, the board uh, basically, um, presumably breached their fiduciary duty by by um, paying Conrad Black uh, what was allegedly um, uh, compensation for non-compete, which was bogus. Okay, let's assume that's the case. So that's a breach of fiduciary duty. That's a civil, uh, I, I don't understand what, where, what makes it rise to the level. I mean, Conrad Black basically said, hey, the board, uh, they thought it's, you know, maybe they breached their fiduciary duty, but where is the criminal part, which is what confuses me? Well, I think that's somewhat the question. I, 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 I think I'm right, based on my reading of Judge Posner's decision at the Seventh Circuit, that, that there were at least some elements of this deal that, that had not been disclosed to the board. Is, is that correct? So, so it, it, it's not clearly that the board was necessarily breaching their fiduciary duty, that in fact, Black himself had not told the board everything. but but. What, what else do you, want to, do you want to say about that? Well, I think that that's right. I mean, in order for it to be a criminally punishable fraud, there has to be not only a breach of a duty, but there unquestionably also has to be misrepresentations in an effort to conceal. That's really what makes, these, what makes a fraud a fraud in the criminal law traditionally. And I do think a lot of what had begun to trouble ju judges, both in the Second Circuit primarily and then Justice Scalia when he wrote Sorich, was this suggestion that essentially where the law had developed was that the proof of a breach of fiduciary duty was almost becoming enough on its own to be a violation of the honest services statute because the statute was so undefined. And that couldn't be the state of the law. And he used, I think, some of these examples that were hyperbolic in order to illustrate 
what he was suggesting about the vagueness, but I think that's exactly the concern that's led us to where we are now. Mr. Stern, uh, please wait for your mic. Uh, Henry Stern, uh, New York Civic. <clears throat> the first night, I really enjoyed the panel. It was like I was back in law school, but without having to do papers or take exams. And I think it was very good. I think the panel was somewhat, uh, s somewhat in favor of the defense uh, rather than the prosecution. And I guess that's the gestalt, <coughs> the gestalt here. I have one reservation. Of, I'm very worried about Clarence Black, Conrad Black, because I don't like prosecuting publishers of newspapers mm -hmm. and purveyors of ideas. Uh, for technical criminal offenses. Uh, you could do the same to Rupert Murdoch or anyone you didn't like in him. Certain in the numerous transactions that Murdoch has entered into, there is ground somewhere for, uh, <clears throat> for review. But why can't these things be, be solved rationally? Why can't a, a panel of legislators and judges sit down and work this out? Why does it have to be in each case a law is passed, years later the courts throw it out or change it, and they try again without speaking? I mean, some conduct of entrepreneurs is terrible. It is criminal. Uh, it's an outrage uh, what, what some people with money and power do. And there ought to be a way of bringing them to justice without enormously complicated uh, you know, fights over particular transactions. I'm just m more sympathetic in a way. To the but let me ask this. The, the statue's been in effect for many years, the, the honor services. C can someone do a review of it? How many people were convicted under it? How many of those people were really essentially innocent or just co committed minor offenses which didn't justify crime or criminalization, uh, and how many were real uh, scoundrels who deserved what they got and might not have gotten it any other way. I mean, w what's the experience uh, under this law? And once you've examined and analyzed that, uh, what's a way to correct this problem uh, so you don't have the two extremes of undefined honest services and uh, requiring a conviction on all kinds of technical details, which a notary will understand. That's my question. Um, well, I think you're, you're right to call for more empirical work. I think there is a shortage of empirical work on the subject, and that is actually an issue. It means that, to some extent, policymakers are navigating in the dark. There is a very serious challenge to good empirical work on this issue, and that challenge that most of these uh, cases are settled. Uh, uh, yeah, are pled uh, at a relatively early stage. And so it's harder to get the details about the actual strength of those cases when only a small number of the charges that are brought are ever actually going to trial. You know, when you look at the trial population, you're looking at a, a not very representative sample of the cases that are brought under a particular statute. Um, you know, when you mentioned a panel of judges and legislatures, I know this isn't exactly what you meant, but I was reminded of the people that put together the model penal code. Uh, which is an extremely thoughtful document uh, that was put together to serve primarily as a model for criminal codes at the state level. Uh, they sorted out a lot of these problems in terms of determining mens rea standards. They have a very clear framework where knowingly always means the same thing no matter where it appears in which statute. And so if what we want to have is thoughtful law that is well designed, uh, I would be interested in seeing Congress take more seriously the recommendations in the model penal code, which already exist, and maybe adopt some of those recommendations at the federal level. Uh, we should standardize the mens rea terminology and importing
using the, the terms as they appear in the model penal code would be a good way to do that. Uh, the other problem is the federal criminal code is now uh, scattered uh, all over uh, the United States code. It's not collected in one place in the books. And uh, one reason Congress may you know, enjoy passing new laws is because it's not entirely clear to them what they've already criminalized in the past. Because it's not in one place, they can't look it up. So I think just moving all those criminal uh, uh, statutes to one place in the United States Code would be another extremely simple thing that would just improve the quality of the legislation that comes in at the federal level, which I think is what you're really interested in. Um, well, Congress could. Uh, the, the, the trick is convincing them. And, and, and there's also, states a lot of times do things like this as well, where uh, there's actually a committee uh, a, a codes committee or something of this effect. New York has it, certain states have it, where if you're going to enact a criminal sanction, you've got a specialized committee uh, that actually has to review this so you can sort of compare and contrast across you know, what we're doing with the criminal law because what's happening now at the federal level is you've got a lot of laws where they're just saying, oh, let's just stick a crime in there, stick a criminal law in there. It's not going through judiciary. It's not going through a systematic review. So we've got you know, Heritage Foundation says over 4,000 federal laws, and that's not even counting all the regulatory offenses through the Code of Federal Regulations that Marie was talking about. So it's, it's, it's really chaotic, and, and I, I tend to think Andy was, was exactly right to, to suggest that a prosecutor can't find a crime for something that's going on it would, would be somewhat of a bizarre uh, assertion. Uh, the, the, the problem is, what, what may, a lot of these cases, particularly the business cases and, and the political cases, I mean, you're talking about lobbying on the one hand and, and campaign contributions. I mean, th this is how our system works. So we got to be very careful about uh, prosecuting people for, for what's really standard practice. And then in the business context, yes, some of these folks are doing shady stuff, but, but what looks shady to one person, it, it might be aggressive business to another. And so this sort of risk taking that's fundamental to American capitalism, uh, it, it's important not to deter that. And that's what these ambiguous laws or these vague laws can do. We, we heard from that in, in the panel we did last June on this topic. Uh, when we were uh, talking with Ken Langone, who's been at the forefront of this. And so if, if, if we try to just do this on this ad hoc basis that's been done, uh, it could really be damaging to our economy. And so, so it makes a lot more sense to try to have some sort of specificity and some sort of clarity. And, and, and these sorts of review processes that, that you've suggested that Marie's talking about make a lot of sense to me. Do, do you have more to add on that, Andy? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it was interesting that it was 23 years between McNally in 1987 and, where, and these cases that have come to the Supreme Court. And there were challenges to the vagueness of this law fairly shortly after McNally came out in 1987. But there are commentators who've suggested that part of the reason it took this long was that for the first 15 years, the Department of Justice was fairly uniform in the way they used the statute, that they really used it in cases of clear-cut fraud. In the public sector, it was cases that were obviously bribery behavior. In the private context, it was used in situations which were obviously monetary fraud. And so there was very little room for defendants or appellants to suggest that somehow they had been abused by this vague statute. And what you see is a lot of cases in the 90s where courts say, we're troubled by the vagueness of this statute. But even though it's vague, it's clear that this conduct was prohibited. I think what you started seeing in the last 10 years was a little bit more creative use of the statute to go after schemes that were not necessarily so clearly fraudulent. And that's when the court started getting a little bit more troubled and a little bit more involved. But it is, I think, unusual for it to take as long as it took for a statute this vague to get to this, this point. Other questions? One more, Mr. Hockman, and then, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Last uh, question. I know a lot of us have got busy schedules. Edward Hoffman, New York City. Um, as Jim knows, a friend of mine, Harvey Silverglade, just wrote a book called Three Felonies a Day, which essentially says that federal statutes are so vague, it can indict anyone, anytime, for almost anything. Uh, let me start with a silly example. The Yankee fans in this room know that the Yankees signed a pitcher a few years ago named Carl Pavano for $40 million. He hit an injury, it was misrepresented, he really never played for the Yankees, 
the Yankee fans were outraged. Could a prosecutor sue Carl Pavano to get the $40 million back on the grounds that he stole honest services from the Yankee fans? And that's not even well, my it's a, it's a criminal statute, so it's, it's really even scarier than that. The question is, could you put the guy in jail for 20 years because he <laughs> deprived the Yankees of honest services? Um, I don't know. How big a stretch of the statute would that be? Well, I'm an Orioles fan, and I saw Pavano pitch in a couple of his early starts, and I would say that the Yankees fans, you know, had at least a colorable claim. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on, on a serious note, as I am also represent corporations, I don't litigate anymore. I have no idea how to advise clients. They say structure deals now. In the old yeah. days, you used to bring in a tax guy, maybe a real estate guy. Now, now to structure business, you have to bring in a criminal attorney uh, to cover yourselves. Yeah. Henry Stern, uh, far more than I both served in government. If there are alleged bribery and honest services claims on one end, we were on the other. I didn't think I did anything wrong, but after listening to you guys, I wonder <laughs> whether I should uh, plead the fifth when anyone asks what I did. Um, attorneys beware. Um, after seeing what's happened to the guys in the Bush Justice Department who are under attack for the advice they gave to, to George W. Bush and you know the claims, uh, are attorneys, I, I forgot which one of the panelists mentioned it, going to be liable somehow if they give quote unquote wrong advice on statutes that no one can seemingly understand? And I guess my only real question is would it pay to have a general federal criminal code to try to bring order to this chaos? Well, on the question about uh, whether y you can be criminally indicted for giving the wrong legal advice, the answer is unambiguously yes. Uh, that was the, the Arthur Anderson case, which of course went to the Supreme Court. Now, uh, the, uh, the conviction of the attorney in that case who had, uh, you know, who had rendered a very plausible interpretation of a very vague statute regarding obstruction of justice uh, was eventually um, reversed. But uh, it can absolutely happen. And I, and I do think you're seeing a lot of folks who are advising pension funds, who are advising, uh, you know, give, are, are dealing with fiduciaries on a daily basis, really pulling their hair out, trying to figure out where the contours of this law are. And I think it will be interesting to see what happens if the court doesn't strike the statute down, how much guidance, how, you know, where the road uh, signs are that the court's able to put up. That's, I think, when you have commentators who say, it's hard to imagine the court leaving the statute on the books and trying to give guidance. I think part of that is it's hard to imagine how the court would do that in a meaningful way. And I think that is a continuing issue. Uh, it is interesting. I mean, there's no, there's no question that the panel you've gotten tonight was a, was a pro-defense panel. So if Jim advertised this as kind of a middle of the road, both <laughs> sides get presented, he may get indicted for honest services fraud. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I do think it's, it, it, it leads to some real, real, questions about how you govern your conduct and in many ways that was kind of a core issue in the ring trial and the Abramoff cases. There was no question that there were House and Senate rules that set forth how much people could take and I don't think there were many staffers who really thought when they got a ticket to the owner's suite at Redskins Stadium which was you know $250 face value ticket that they weren't aware that was over a $50 limit. The question is, is that a federal crime? And the government would say it was because they knew that they were violating an applicable rule and were therefore committing a fraud. I don't think that many of the folks that were engaged in lobbying on both sides 10 years ago thought that they were committing felonies even when they were living high on the hog in DC. Um, as, a, as a white collar DC practitioner, you know, you kind of are not you know, it's interesting to see where this is going because the number of potential prosecutions is immense. What's interesting, though, is in the post Abramoff world, there were criminal laws written. It is now a crime as a lobbyist to give a gift that exceeds the applicable rules. It is now a misdemeanor. It's never once been used to prosecute a lobbyist since 2007. So it is an interesting question of what is leading these cases? Is it the statute that governs the prosecutions or is it the discovery of distasteful conduct that then leads to a search for an applicable law? And that's, I think, where a lot of these justices are so concerned about the, the, the vagueness of these statutes. If I can just add one thing that, that Andy raised, um, uh, it regards the, the sort of the perceived scale of the offense by lawmaking bodies is a big issue here because if you have a specific law 
that addresses certain conduct and makes it, say, a misdemeanor, public, you know, punishable by a fine or by maybe up to a year in jail, uh, should that also be covered by an extremely vague law like the Federal Honest Services Statute that is a federal felony publish punishable by up to 20 years in prison? Um, you know, when, when given the opportunity to specifically address this crime and the gravity of this crime, uh, obviously Congress chose to make it a much, much smaller um, uh, Offense, and so that's another problem with uh, the federal honest services laws. You know, maybe you, uh, you know, say you did violate a prophylactic disclosure rule regarding potential conflicts of interest as a state lawmaker. This may be enough to get you officially reprimanded under the the ethics rules of the state uh, legislative body. Conceivably, it's even an infraction or a misdemeanor at the state level, punishable by again a few months or by a fine or by loss of the office. Uh, and so when we have these a vague federal statutes, uh, you may be able to go after behavior that for some reason or other you really want to address, but you're bringing a sledgehammer to something that, you know, when lawmakers have focused on it specifically, they want to treat as a less serious offense. And I think that's also a big problem. I, I do want to make one clarification. Andy said that, that this has been pro-defense. I, 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 just, just as in the civil litigation context, I don't, I don't want to have anyone say, well, the Center for Legal Policy is pro-defense when it comes to civil litigation or when it comes to, to, to criminal prosecutions. Uh, I think what we want are, are good rules. We want fair rules. Uh, we want to deter the conduct that is really bad. And in criminal conduct, we really want to deter that conduct that is, is knowingly bad, that really, really offends our sensibilities as a society. Uh, and, and civil conduct, we may have a, a slightly lesser standard, but we want to deter bad conduct and not frivolous litigation and not careerist-oriented prosecution. Uh, in that respect, I, I, I do want to say in closing, I'm, I'm, I'm distraught by your hypothetical about the Yankees. Uh, I think you've opened up the door to a new form of careerist prosecution. Uh, folks on both sides of the aisle, some of whom I like, some of whom I don't, from Rudy Giuliani to Elliot Spitzer to, to Chris Christie, have been very aggressive and somewhat creative in their prosecutions and have used that as a springboard to a political career. So I hope they're not going to do that in the Major League Baseball context. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I hope this has been as informative for you guys as it has for me. Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.